Good afternoon and welcome to Chat with Green Aggies, April 1st. It's April Fool's Day, but y'all are not fools because you're here to learn something about trees. And we're happy to have you. I'm going to uh, ask everybody to introduce themselves in the panel. And um, uh, first up, the guy with no voice, the guy who's got his microphone muted. <laughs> yeah, Dr. thanks. Dr. Fong the Fly. I've lost my voice a little bit yet. Yeah, yeah Erfan Bafai here. Thank you. Yep, he's our entomologist at the Overton Center. And next we have Dr. Becky Bowling. Afternoon, I'm Becky Bowling. I am our Extension Urban Water Specialist here at Dallas. And she's actually in the center today, which is why she's kind of whispering. I'm being so, quiet. <laughs> quiet, not as loud as normal. Um, and then we have Dr. Chrissy Seegers. Hello, I'm not at the Dallas Center today, so I can be as loud as I want to be, um, but I am Chrissy Seegers, and I'm the turf grass specialist at the Dallas Center. Okay, and we have Dr. Carlos Bogran, our buddy from OHP. Hi, I'm uh, Carlos, uh, Senior Technical Manager with OHP. Uh, we market uh, and develop uh, crop protection chemicals, including biologicals. Uh, glad to be here. I used to be extension faculty, so that's why I know many of these guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Carlos. And we have Mr. Paul Winsky coming to us from Harris County. Thank you, Laura. I'm Paul Winsky, and I am the County Extension Agent for Commercial Horticulture down here in Harris County. All right, and we're supposed to have Dr. Mung Mung Gu on today, but I haven't seen her yet. And so if I have nothing to say about a slide, you will know that that's Dr. Goo's slide and I don't know what she meant <laughs> to say about it. So I'm just gonna get started. We may have to backtrack a little bit, but I'll, I'll get started and kind of um, hope she'll jump on here quickly. Um, all right, so today's our topics. This is tree day for, for us here at Chat with Green Aggies. And we're gonna talk a lot about live oaks in the winter storm. And that's a, a, a big question that I've been getting from lots of landscapers. They're sending me pictures of leaves and uh, also from homeowners around town. Just, you know, is there something wrong with our live oaks? Are, are they okay after the storm? What's going on with them? Do they have oak wilt? Do they have another disease? I'm getting lots of those questions. And then I just wanted to share with you uh, a thesis um, written by a student at, in uh, Canada, in uh, British Columbia, in Vancouver. Um, she did a large survey of, of urban foresters and urban forest um, managers and people who recommend trees in urban areas and talked a lot about encouraged and discouraged trees as street trees in urban areas. And it's a really interesting uh, study with some cool things to talk about. And so um, we will talk a little bit about that. All right, so let's look at our live oaks. This was, this was back in February. Um, live oaks, as you know, are broadleaf evergreen. So typically they hold their leaves through the winter. Um, they actually do cycle leaves as all y'all know, but uh, they will, typically hang on to them until the new leaves start coming out. So you don't really notice them ever being bare like they are this year. Um, most of the time um, you will see still at this time of year, they're, they're dropping leaves. So you will notice leaves on the ground, but you won't see those bare branches that we're seeing this year. And that is just because it got so darn cold. All right, so this is the, the one of the ways, you know, and there's a lot of controversy on, do you decide, when do you decide if a tree or another woody plant is dead or alive? And th there's a lot of, of different ways of getting at it. One is kind of scratching down to see if you see active cambium. So if you see nothing happening underneath the bark, um, that tree may be dead. Uh, it also may be dormant still. So of uh, for deciduous trees, not so much live oaks, but for a lot of deciduous plants, their cambium won't really look like much during the winter. So this, this technique has its limitations, but in 
And, and also you can sometimes see green cambium when a tree really does have serious damage, but it hasn't quite figured that out yet. So tree cambium is one way. Another way is kind of uh, the, the snap test, I guess, and Neil Sperry's e-newsletter e this past week had a lot of uh, suggestion that that was a better way of determining just, you know, does a branch just break off? Is it just brittle, um, which is a sign that it's not alive. I would say that in all of these cases, if you have the opportunity to be patient with the plant, that's that's a good um, option, especially with the large tree. Um, trees, I've heard say, are dead for years before they realize it, but they're also just kind of slow to respond to stress. So we saw that with the 2000. 11 drought where trees suffered for, for years afterwards, we'll probably see it with this freeze. Um, but you've got to give the tree a little bit of time to, to decide what it's going to do, live or die. All right, so when we talk about um, pruning off dead material, we, we talked about this in chat with Green Aggies and, and reasons to prune trees or reasons to prune anything, removing dead or diseased wood is, is always considered to be acceptable. It's acceptable, but sometimes it's hard to determine. So if you do know that something is um, broken, obviously, then it's, it's cool to go ahead and remove that. With live oaks, we have the particular problem in Texas that uh, we have oak wilt disease. And oak wilt is more easily transmittable from say February through June. So we typically say don't prune an oak between those, those months. And sometimes you have to, sometimes you've got a problem, you've got a broken branch, you've got a hazard, you've got a reason that you have to go ahead and do that. But on the other hand, it is still advisable to hold off on pruning oaks during that time period. Um, you certainly wouldn't wanna prune for some of these lower reasons if you don't have to. I mean, not eliminating hazard, but reducing the plant size or aesthetics would be reasons not to prune right now. Eliminating structural problems would be better accomplished in oaks in other seasons. Okay, obviously, if you've got something like this where you have broken branches, you've got to prune. So if you can wait, wait. I think we'll probably say this about 300,000 times. All right, so um, people are also asking, are we going to have another freeze? Are we going to have that traditional Texas Easter freeze? I, I don't think so. It doesn't look like it. Now, at my farm last night, it got down to 33 degrees. That's uh, west of Fort Worth. So I will say that we are flirting with freezing around, around here, I'm mm -hmm. certain that points north, uh, if anybody's on here from the panhandle, it probably is going to freeze again. But for us, I think we're probably at least pretty close to being out of the woods on freezes. And if we do have another freeze, it's not gonna be anything like what we experienced in February. So how cold was it? I, I know we've talked about this quite a lot. It was really cold. It was extremely cold, but it wasn't cold for as long as it has been. For example, in you know the famous December of 1983, um, we had more days under freezing than we had um, this year in, in our 2021 freeze. Um, 1989 also we had um, another serious freeze. So I don't know. What do what are what is going to happen? Um, what's going to happen next in our weather? Uh, we've been in a La Nina, which is typically um, warm, dry weather. We are now transitioning out of that and and going into a neutral period, and that um, kind of typically creates a different sort of weather and a transition in the weather. And sometimes I've heard it said that the middle of the country has to fight for their next uh, weather and we'll see more of that instability and more, more possible severe weather as we move through this spring. So what's happening with our oaks now? 
well, some of them are, are doing their thing. Some of them are, are growing the new leaves that we would expect this time of year. Some of them are flowering as they should this time of year, but others are not. So you can see a lot of genetic diversity as you look down a street full of live oak trees. Um, you can see uh, in this picture, this one looks pretty much like what people would say is, is my tree dead? Is, is my tree dead? And then down here, this looks great. It looks perfectly normal. And this one's somewhere in between. And this is just on one street and this is not unusual. So why do we have all this going on? Well, we have a lot of genetic variability in, in live oaks, especially. They're, they're not always, but typically propagated from seed. And so there's, there's naturally just variations in genetic um, qualities based upon seed propagated trees. So we have a lot of seed propagated trees and they're always gonna be variable. Um, the other thing going on with live oaks is, whoops, that should not have been there, but they're provenance. Um, live oaks, as we know, are Quercus virginiana because they grow all the way up to Virginia, but they basically grow kind of mostly in coastal areas. They grow down this, this Atlantic coast, all the way around Florida and all the way through Florida. There, there are live oaks all over Florida, then around the Gulf Coast. And then we have this population, which is sometimes broken off and I know there's fusiformis, probably people, proponents in the crowd, but we have these populations and also in Mexico, these southern populations that extend quite a distance from the coast. And these are really different trees, if you think about it. So this tree growing over here on the west coast of Florida um, gets 50 inches of rain a year. Uh, it rarely gets down below freezing. Maybe every few years it happens to get down below freezing. And this may be where the nursery is getting its seed, especially if it's a, a tree nursery in Florida, it's kind of likely. So this, this tree grown over here is adapted to a really different climate from what you might have over here in the Edwards Plateau of Texas or right up here west of Fort Worth, like at my farm, uh, we have live oaks and they are you know, going to get 20 to 25 inches of rainfall in an average year. Um, they're not they're not adapted to the same conditions. So these are typically smaller, their leaves are smaller, they're more adapted to drought conditions. And that provenance will make a big difference in your your live oak and, and how well it can handle cold and drought. And if you think about it too, um, you've got probably zone 10 down here with live oaks growing in it, and you've got you know, zone seven up in here, zone seven up in here with live oaks. So you've got a pretty broad range of sources for your plants. All right, so what's next for our trees? Are you watering? Are you fertilizing? Well, this is the time of year that we normally do start seeing some rain around here. May is one of our wettest months. Um, if if we're not if we do not have rain, you probably should be irrigating landscapes as we move into the warm weather, where the plants are going to be putting out new leaves or transpiring a lot, so they're going to need that water. Um, is it time to fertilize? Yeah, it's the time to fertilize trees if you're going to do that. Um, this is the time when they're pushing out new growth and can make use of that nitrogen that you apply. All right, how to prepare for the next cold uh, season. This is my monk slide and I am not sure what she had in mind here. Um, so I'm gonna say uh, always whenever you're going into um, any kind of stress as any kind of plant, it's good to be as healthy as you can be, right? And same thing for people, if, you, if you've got a, a you know, you got to write a bunch of papers or something. You want to, you know, make sure you get some sleep and you eat some healthy meal and then you, you know, go into the stress fully, fully prepared. So the same thing goes for trees. You want to try to help them through this growing period to, to have a good, uh, successful year. Um, uh, 
I guess uh, mulching is always recommended for cold protection. Mulching is good because it moderates the soil temperatures. It moderates those summer soil temperatures too, which is really great. So mulching is a great practice um, for tree health. Um, anything else? Do y'all have anything that you think would help prepare trees for our next freeze? Does anybody have another, another good suggestion? They're leaving me hanging here. How, how about uh, uh, watering and mulching? Yeah, yeah, absolutely mulching. Yeah, watering um, before a freeze, and Carlos is, is probably thinking of this, is a recommended practice because that water does um, moderate the temperature of the soil. It holds heat basically in the soil and the change of state will, will release heat. So irrigation before a freeze, not during a freeze because we all know how bad that is, but before a freeze is also highly recommended. And one thing that helped us get through this last freeze was the snow cover. It absolutely served as mulch. It served as a, as a little bit of moisture. So it really did help us get through that last freeze but we may not be so lucky next time. Anybody else have something? Okay. Well, if you think of a great idea on how to help trees prepare for the next big freeze, um, because we, we may have another one. People are like, well, when, will this happen again in, in the next, you know, how many years? I don't know. You don't know, none of us know. When you look back historically, a lot of times this was compared to the freeze of 1980, I mean, 1899. So that's almost a hundred, well, it's more than a hundred years ago, but we had those two really serious freezes, 1983 and 1989, only six years apart. So I don't know, it's hard to say when we will have our next um, seriously cold spell, very hard to say. All right, so moving on to this exciting thesis. Um, this is the, the link, you can find it online. Uh, the question posed to a whole bunch of professionals and I did answer this survey, so that was why I received a copy of the thesis when it was done, was which selection criteria do street, planting, uh, street tree planting professionals value and which species do professionals associate with valued characteristics? So it, it was a kind of a long survey, lots of Likert scales. The, the thesis itself is definitely long, but I'm just going to kind of pull some things out and talk about them because there's a lot of interesting information here. All right, this is the dedication on the thesis, and I, this kind of was touching to me. Uh, to all the trees growing in concrete boxes, your exuberant bud breaks in the face of adversity forever inspire me. And this is my walk out of work. I would say it's my walk into work, but I'm facing out of the building. Um, and it, it is inspiring each and every day to walk under these kind of sad lace bark elms and see them just, you know, doing their best to make leaves and, and get the job done. And they kind of make that little canopy over me as I go into work and give me that little blessing to get on with my day. So I just want to thank all the street trees that encourage me. And I hope that you, you have some trees somewhere that are encouraging you. Um, but I, I, the dedication to this thesis was really very touching. All right, so here's where the survey respondents were. As I mentioned, the, the survey writer was up here in Canada in British Columbia, and she did a pretty good job of getting this survey out over a big area. And you can see we've got a little dot here for Dallas-Fort Worth. Um, I don't see anything down here in Houston or in Austin or San Antonio, but we do have Texas um, represented in the survey responses. And this is uh, the, Kupen Geiger climate region. This we're in a really big one in the most of the most of Texas and definitely the eastern part of Texas is in this CSB, which is a warm temperate climate with a dry warm summer. So you can see this is a large part of the United States that we're kind of grouped in with. Um, and also like parts of South America and parts of Africa and parts of um, many other places. So this was the, the, the Venn diagram that, that made me want to talk to y'all about this. 
um, people were asked to give some species that they encouraged the planting of these species as street trees in urban area, in the urban areas where they work, and then trees that they discouraged planting in uh, uh, street trees in the areas where they work. And I and I because it is April Fools, I, I thought about just making a whole presentation about the beauty of the um, calorie pear. Um, you can see pyrus species pretty much came strongly out over here, uh, but but it, but I didn't want anyone to take me seriously, so I, I was afraid to do that. Um, you can see though that there are a lot of a lot of species, including this calorie pear, that fall in this middle. So that means that some people discourage them and some people encourage them, and. It wasn't so much, uh, you would think, oh, obviously some trees are suitable for some areas and some trees are suitable for other areas. And that's definitely true. And you will see that when you look at the list of encouraged and discouraged trees. But it wasn't so much that. It was, you know, in the same area, how do we end up with a tree? Um, let's just take one that does grow, or a couple right here that do grow pretty well around here. Ginkgo biloba, the, the ginkgo tree, obviously not native to this area, but fairly widely used and fairly successfully used. And then uh, Quercus macrocarpa or bur oak, which is which is native to a large part of the United States, and also you know fairly frequently planted. Both of those kind of fell in this category of you know some people are like mm -mm, and some people are yeah definitely. And I can see on both of these they have both of these two species have something in common in that if you have a female ginkgo, it's a messy tree and it smells bad. And if you have a, a bur oak, it's going to drop big old acorns. And some people do not like to clean up big old acorns. So I can see maybe both of these are like, you know, losing points in the I want a tidy tree on my street, uh, you know, contest. But I don't know. It's just kind of interesting that something like Quercus virginiana, our live oak, falls into this category. Um, some people recommend it. Others don't recommend it. Uh, why would that be? Well, in the case of this one, I don't recommend it as a street tree, even though it's widely used as a street tree, because really it's it's going to get too big. I mean, unless you've got a big old wide street with big old wide areas to plant, which doesn't happen very often, um, it's, it's just not going to have the life that it deserves in that situation. Okay, so the top 15 species, and there were 746 people who responded, and they listed 144 species, but the top 15 species are right here. And there's some really interesting things here. So uh, the, the top species was the Kentucky coffee tree. Um, it's a rare tree. It, I, I was like, is that even native to Texas? I don't even know. I don't see Kentucky coffee trees out in nature, but it is. It is supposedly native to Texas. It's actually on the USDA map native to Tarrant County, though I don't know that I've seen any growing anywhere. But um, Kentucky coffee tree is rare in nature. Now, is it a good tree? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's, it's a legume, so it's a, a I got all the benefits that legumes have um, in that they're usually pretty tough. They're usually pretty low uh, input requiring trees, but it's also not a common tree in the wild anywhere. So that was kind of interesting. So is this an example of people trying to um, diversify the tree species? And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in their urban areas. Is that one of the reasons that it's so widely recommended? Is it just really a great tree? I don't know. Um, oaks, uh, this was not very specific, but absolutely here in Texas, we have lots of great oak trees. Um, so they kind of take away a bit from diversity, in my opinion. Um, honey locust. Well, gosh, honey locust is uh, both loved by some and hated by others. Uh, definitely not widely used as a street tree around here, though I've seen it in other places, even though it is native. Quercus bicolor is the white swamp oak, which is more of a Midwestern oak, so we really don't see that around here. Celtis occidentalis is hackberry. Now, what we typically have is 
uh, Levagata, Celtis Levagata, which is sugarberry. So it's a different tree, but they are kind of similar. And it still does surprise me whenever I'm in another town and I see a bunch of hackberries planted along the street. I'm kind of like, oh man, you know, because those are the trees that we that we all have growing in our environment, but it's pretty much always an accident. Our, our sugar berries are pretty much always planted by birds, not people. So there's our ginkgo again. There's the, the bur oak. Nissa sylvatica is tupelo. Tupelo is a beautiful tree, but I don't think it would do very well here. Here's this one. This was actually my suggestion because I'm a I'm a cypress, I'm a bald cypress lover. So uh taxodium just come. I like it as a street tree because of its form, mostly. It, it tends to grow with a nice, um, you know, uh, X current growth habit that grows up nice and tall. They're pretty adaptable to lots of different areas. And I really like them as street trees. Um, and going along here, all sorts of elms. Um, uh, London plane tree, which we don't see a lot around here, but is widely known as being very tolerant of pollution and a great street tree. Uh, this is our uh, chinkapin oak, which would be a recommended tree on my list. Uh, red oak, though not our red oak, not Schumardii or uh, Buckleyi that we have around here. Live oak, once again, gosh darn too big for a street tree in my opinion, and Parodia. So that was really an interesting list. So here's my uh, taxodiums in downtown Fort Worth growing quite politely in this nice little bed next to a parking garage. Um, why did people choose these encouraged uh, trees? They were asked to rate them on these Likert scales. Um, there's a, a large number of criteria they use, too many to put in this presentation, but um, Basically, most people said that they were looking for tolerance to the stress of the urban environment. So tolerance to heat, because we know a lot about urban heat islands are, are a problem, tolerance to drought, tolerance to soil compaction and to limited soil volume, um, also about their size and form. And that was what, you know, put the, the, the bald cypress over the top for me. I just like the way it looks and the way it grows in an urban environment their tidiness. So people who plant the trees are often responsible for maintaining them and they're responsible for keeping the, the stuff off the sidewalk. So looking for a tidy tree is a big deal in, in urban street trees. And then their attractiveness. So the discouraged top 15, once again, 144 species were mentioned by these same 746 people. So the number one species, and I, I just couldn't put a picture in here, is, is indeed the calorie pear, like a Bradford pear. And that's what's right in front of my building. You go past that nice little lace bark elm alley, and then there's um, Bradford pears right in front of the building. And people just love them. You know, they love them sometimes when they're in flower. They, they, they love the way their branches just split apart, and they just fall in the parking lot, and they have to clean them up. Um, people love running into them because, you know, they're, they're, they're right there in the parking lot and, and they're so great. You know, if you run into one of those, you know, it, it um, doesn't hurt your car too much because it just falls apart. So they're great for that. Um, but uh, I'm making some jokes here, y'all. Uh, they are the top discouraged tree among this, this whole entire list. Um, I think that probably ashes were were we have had real problems with emerald ash borers, so I think that's a pest related um, occurrence of this, uh, but maybe not on this list. Um, this could happen to any tree species that we plant a lot of. Uh, obviously, when you don't have diversity, and we're going to talk more about that, you're you're leaving yourself open to some kind of pest, some kind of problem that's gonna come along and take out a whole lot of trees. So that's one of the many reasons that diversity is good. You see lots of maples here, lots of maples. Um, another ash, our honey locust again, probably for its thorniness or something like that. Um, but this was the 
Um, cottonwood, which yeah, I probably wouldn't plant a cottonwood as a street tree. Um, they're, they grow too fast and too big and they make a big mess. So yeah, discourage top 15. Okay, so why are they discouraged? Well, here were the reasons that people gave, uh, top reasons. They, uh, one was that they are invasive or potentially invasive in the area. So that was, that was something that most people are considering. In the past, I don't know if we considered it as much. I'm pretty sure we didn't. That's why we used to plant China berries and Chinese tallows and all kinds of things. But it, nowadays, it's, it's definitely a concern for most people who are selecting urban trees. Uh, damages to the infrastructure. So trees that produce lots of surface roots like live oaks do often tear up sidewalks, they tear up parking lots. Um, this is one reason for selecting uh, a tree that maybe doesn't do that. Requiring significant pruning. Well, why is that? That's going to increase your maintenance costs over time. So people are uh, looking for trees that are going to naturally grow into the size and shape that, that would be desirable in that environment. The risk of limb breakage. Um, I'm pretty sure that's why people don't like Bradford pears, actually. One of the many reasons is that they do tend to lose limbs pretty frequently. Production of allergenic pollen. Well, here in Texas, we don't have to plant trees to get our allergenic pollen because it just grows wild for us. And I think that's true in lots of places. But when I lived in Tampa, Florida, um, there are lots of live oaks that are native, but they're also really, really widely planted in landscapes. And in the spring, there was so much pollen that it really did bother me. It really gave me allergies. And I don't have those anymore now that I'm in Texas where maybe we don't have quite as many live oaks. Um, production of debris. Uh, once again, the people who have to choose the trees often have to maintain them and clean up after them. And then this was, was one of the reasons. It's everywhere in my community. So that's the anti-tree diversity message. It's like we already have enough of them. Um, and that is a reason for not wanting to plant more. Okay, so this was um, a scale that kind of shows you these species are not ones that I would probably necessarily I would want to talk about, but it just shows you how a, a particular this was the most favorably rated um, tree in the entire thing in the entire uh, entire list of species. And this is hop horn, American hop horn beam, which I don't see around here, but it was most favorably strongly encouraged by more people, discouraged by very few people, okay? So, and, and their reason, I don't know what their reason is, but it, it could have been anything, but discouraged by very few people. On the other hand, um, on the other end of the world, this is the, the least encouraged tree because it, it's only encouraged by 7% of the people and it's discouraged by 76% of the people. Once again, this is not a tree that we've got around here in any kind of quantity. Okay. So rarity of encouraged trees. Now, one thing they did was they asked people to categorize themselves, right? Are you a landscape architect? Are you in public horticulture, do you, which would be a botanic garden or an arboretum? Um, do you work for a parks department? Um, where do you find yourself? Are you, are you a forester? Are you an arboriculturist? Um, how do you define yourself? So that, that was related to um, their propensity to try to select the same trees or, or uh, different trees. And this kind of shows that people in public horticulture are most interested in having rare species for their city, which totally makes sense because you think, what is a garden supposed to do? Show you a whole lot of plants, plants that you don't necessarily see all over the place. So that that totally makes sense to me. On the other end of the scale, the people who are less likely to take a chance on something, I guess, if you want to look at it this way, are the parks and recreation departments. And I kind of see that too, because, you know, they're like, we got this budget, we don't want to replace these trees, we want to make sure they do good. Um, 
We want to make sure that they're functional in this situation. So we're going to go with what we know. Becky, did you have something to say? I was just going to say that I think Meng Meng finally joined us. Oh, did Meng Meng join <laughs> us? Well, I don't geez. know if she can talk or. <laughs> Meng Meng, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. I can hear you now. Yeah. Do okay, you want, great. If you want to go back to something and talk about it, because there were some things that I wasn't sure what you wanted to say. But um, if you want to go back to something, we can do that. Um, no, no, no. Why don't you go ahead and finish? Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, so this is what I was going to talk about next, which is basically just diversity and how does this work with the survey. So there's this thing called the 30 20 10 rule um, and that rule just basically means that for for every um, tree family or you could think about plant family in the landscape, you should have no more than 30% of one family. 20% of one genus and 10% of one species. So here we are, um, this is in Fort Worth. This is a housing development though. You can see they've already decided that this tree right here, this post oak is worthy of protection. So they built this cute little fence around it and hopefully it's, it's still there, right? So um, essentially in the example, this would be an oak, you know, this is the beach family. And then this is this genus, a uh, Quercus. So you've got, we've got, as I said, lots of great trees in, in the Quercus genus. If there's a post oak, there's probably a blackjack oak somewhere. There's, um, you could plant a bur oak, you could plant a chinkapin oak, or there might be one growing. We've got lots of great choices here in Fort Worth among oaks. And then finally, we've got the genus Stellata. So you also, oh, if you were planting, now this is not, uh, necessarily true in uh, preserving things because you, you might want to preserve all your post oaks maybe I don't know but if you're planting you want to plan so that you don't have more than 10 percent of any species here no more than 20 percent of any genus and no more than 30 percent of any family so this is 1990 was when this was kind of proposed and so how, how are we doing well and there's been some some means to, uh, some testing of this uh, most most urban forestry most city programs try to aspire anyway to move toward this um, so of the uh, almost 1700 North American urban forest inventory data sets that that Ambrose and Ambrose studied only 111 met this 10 20 30 guideline Okay, so, so not a really large percentage. The majority of the failures were due to an overabundance of just a few genera of trees, um, maple, ash, and oak. And if you saw discouraged trees, you actually saw that, that um, ash and maple were really well represented in that discouraged tree. So that may be a response to this. Well, we already have enough of those kind of um, kind of school of thought. Um, another study, and this one is by uh, Laura Kendall and Dobbs, found that the relative abundance of most common tree species in cities across North America averages 20%. So for the species, which should be a 10, um, most of the time we have about 20% are twice the recommended abundance. So, uh, and here finally, the most common genera comprise about 30% on average, and the most common family comprised about 32% on average. So we're gonna look at the city of Arlington. So this is the city of Arlington tree inventory data. Um, these are the top trees, and you can see that cedar elms make up about 20% of the trees in the city of Arlington. Some of those are probably native trees that were not planted because that would be an, a tree that is a native tree in Arlington. Um, I'm confident that those sugar berries, those Celtus levigatus, were probably mostly not planted, right? That, that next largest uh, tree species. 
And the post oaks also are native trees. Now that's one that we value, unlike, unlike cedar elms and, and uh, sugar berries, we really value our post oaks. So most people that have a, a, a building site with post oaks try to protect at least some of the trees from, uh, from being removed upon building. And, and unfortunately, you can purchase a cedar elm, no problem. They're, they're pretty easy to produce in nurseries, but post oaks are not easy to produce in a nursery. So they're not really available uh, for planting in the way that other species are. And then we get down. So after those top three, which are all native to the area, we get down into a, a non-native tree, our crepe myrtle, which we all know that, that we here on Chat with Green Aggies are fond of crepe myrtles, but there's there's thousands and thousands in the city of Arlington. Um, they are widely planted. They're easy to grow in nurseries. They're, they're readily available. They flower in the summertime. People like them. So there's a lot of crepe myrtles in most towns. I would say in my neighborhood, and I have gone around and just tried to count, like, you know, how many, if you're walking down the block, how many houses have a crepe myrtle? And it's well over 25% in my neighborhood. Uh, the next tree is a native tree for us here in Tarrant County. And it also has the benefit of being a completely different, um, different uh, genus and species. Well, these are all different genus and species, but it's, but it's more of a different tree than, it's not an oak, it's not an elm, it's, it's different. It's a hickory. Um, <laughs> the pecan tree. Uh, which is not as widely planted as an urban tree, probably because of the nuts. I would think that would be one of the reasons, though it's fairly, fairly often planted in, in parks, but not really as a street tree. And then we have a uh, live oak, American elm, silver maple, hot diggity dog. I don't know why they planted so many of those in Arlington, but somebody did. And then green ash. All right, so when you look, are they, are they meeting the 30, 20, 10? Well, not really, because we're, we're pretty heavy on the Almacea here, on the elm family, which includes the cedar elm, the American elm, and the sugar berry. So that's almost 40% of the trees, right? So that's, that's pretty serious. And if you look at just almost just that genus, that's 22%. So we're not too far off here. And then when we look at just almost crassifolia, cedar elm, we're at 20%. So that's double the 10%. So that was pretty consistent with what those studies found. This is, you know, not a bad tree. It's, it's easy to uh, grow and acquire. It's also a native tree. I, I'm, I would never tell someone that cedar elm was a bad tree, but it is probably too widely used here in Tarrant County anyway. All right, Meng Meng, you've got anything to say now or do you wanna go back to anything? Cause that's all I had for, for that little study. We were just gonna encourage everyone to um, take a moment when you have it and look at our YouTube playlist for Chat with Green Aggies. You can catch up on anything you missed. Um, we also always want to hear from you and this is our survey. Uh, we're trying to figure out what you want us to talk about. And we also are trying to measure whatever good we might be doing in the world. So we really appreciate you letting us know how we're doing. And we've got some exciting things coming up. Um, Becky, do you wanna tell us a little bit about next week? Sure, I'd be happy to. So next week, we're going to have a special guest, uh, Dr. Joey Young from Texas Tech University. And Dr. Young's been doing a lot of great work looking at uh, life in turf grass soils. So um, I think he, he came up with a title uh, after I'd already created this, where he's going to call it What Lies Beneath. <laughs> and so um, he's going to talk to us a little bit about 
organic matter in turf grass systems, which is kind of unique because um, turf grass systems are not disturbed in the way a lot of our other systems are. So we see some interesting things in terms of how, how organic matter can accumulate and, and influence things in those systems, um, and also how that impacts carbon sequestration um, in turf grass. So I think it'll be a really fun, interesting talk on some things we haven't had on here before, um, and also a, a different speaker, which can always be kind of nice too. So I'm excited. I'm excited too. I'm also pretty excited about April 29th because uh, when we first started Chat with Green Aggies, those of y'all who have been tuning in since the very beginning, we were kind of just like, hey, you want to ask us a question or here's something someone sent me this week and I just want to show this and talk about it. And so we're going to kind of go, um, I mean, there, there's benefit in planning and having great people like Dr. Joey Young speak to us, but we're going to go back to our, our origin story here and just have a, a, a chat, you know, so if you have something you'd like for us to talk about on the 29th or you have a picture you'd like for to send us and have us discuss what's going on or anything like that, uh, we would love to hear from you. And we hope that you'll uh, tune in on the 29th and, and bring us your questions. So anybody have any questions about anything we talked about today? Laura, uh, this is Meng Meng. I do have a question about some of the discouraged trees there. Yeah. And there are uh, acers, acers, acers you know, all, yeah. all, all, no, 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 acers, all kinds, prunus, all kinds. And there is another one. I think it's, it was it was populous, all kinds. And why? Pyrus, all and, kinds. And, yeah. And then if you go back to the slide, it, you know, in addition to all these three uh, genus that the, and then some additional species were listed. So why, uh, uh, why do you think that the people just just dislike these well and also a pyrus sorry you know so yeah. acer pyrus prunus and populus why are these just so disliked these all these genus well i know lots of reasons people don't like pyrus in the landscape um, and I think a lot of that is uh, invasiveness, growth habit, you know, just the fact that, that, that we have all these uh, uh, ornamental pairs that, that just kind of disintegrate as they get older. So um, short life, and that's definitely true for prunus too. Um, I don't know, why do you think, Mung <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, throwing the, the question back to me. <laughs> um, for, for me, I think uh, prunus, well, prunus for, for the Texas area, uh, you know, um, I just think the, the, the heat tolerance issue, the disease, the, the disease and insect issue, and then the late, the late freeze on some of these, you know, early flowering uh, plants, you know, those are, those could be potential issues, you know, just, just for, uh, just for prunus. Uh, um, and sure. then, and then poplus, you know, poplus, I think the heat, the heat tolerant, the heat stress is also an issue on that. So and that those are just my guesses. Sure. Well, these are the top reasons that people gave why they would discourage something. So, I mean, I think a lot of these apply to those to those uh, those genuses. So, if you think about it, a lot of those. And, and also, and also in Arlington, you have the number of point myrtles there. I think it was uh, just less than five percent. Uh -huh. Do you think that we should uh, we should be we should be planting more crepe myrtles to make it uh just you know to 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 fill that 10 percent quota <laughs> quote unquote quota it's not a quota you want to stay under that 10 percent because diversity is good so whenever something i mean i i don't know i would never tell someone don't plant a crepe myrtle if they want a crepe myrtle they could plant a crepe myrtle and that would not be on my discouraged list so that would that would be encouraged but anyway um, and I and I think it's it's pretty amazing of all those you know Cramerdo is the only non-native there 
right? Oh, in Arlington. All the others. No, there, yeah. Uh, um, yep. I, I was going to say, uh, silver maple is not native to Arlington. Uh, right, 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 right. So, yeah, so, so, yes, yes, silver maple. Yes, all the rest are, are native trees. You're right. All the rest are native trees. Mm -hmm. So, Arlington is actually doing a pretty good job, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, using, utilizing natives. And we, I mean, we often, and think that you know we're using a lot of uh, uh, introduced plants, but when you look at all these trees, you know the bones, the structure in the urban uh, uh, landscapes. I mean these 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 eight uh, eight out of uh, nine, eight out of ten are all native plants. Uh, they're they're really set the tone of the of the native um, uh, you know vegetation. Sure, they do, and I and I think that's I think that's probably true in many many places, and I think there's a lot of good reasons for that because tree roots, as you know, a tree has to develop a root system that lives in the soil that is there. There's no way you can amend the soil to support a tree's roots throughout its life. So you do need things that that are at least, if not native to your area, really well adapted to the conditions that you have. You're you're not going to get away with something that's not not for very long. So there you go. Okay, y'all, any more questions for us? I'm gonna flip to our coming up again. And uh, we really thank you all for joining in and uh, appreciate you taking the, um, oops, the, the feedback our survey. If you have a chance to do that, we really appreciate it. Um, and thank you all for your time today. <laughs>